Thank you for joining the first webinar in our series on animal-free recombinant antibodies. This series is being co-organized by the U.S. National Toxicological Program Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods, the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, and the PETA International Science Consortium. My name is Catherine Groff. I'm an advisor to the PETA Science Consortium, and I'll be co-moderating today's webinar with David Allen who is the president at Integrated Laboratory Systems and principal investigator of their contract supporting NICEDA. We have two speakers today who will be presenting on animal-free antibodies against diseases. First, we'll hear from Stefan Dubel from the Institute of Biochemistry, Biotechnology, and Bioinformatics at the University of Braunschweig. And then we'll hear from Sachdev Sidhu of the Toronto Recombinant Antibody Center. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to point out that a recording of this webinar will be posted at the link on the screen shortly after its completion. Information about additional webinars in this series can also be found at this link. This webinar requires that you listen via computer audio. If you have called in on your phone, please again switch to computer audio. There will be time for questions for both speakers at the end of the second presentation. Everyone is on mute, but you can type questions or comments in the question section within your GoToWebinar toolbar at any time during the presentations. This toolbar should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Speaking first today will be Dr. Stefan Dubel. As mentioned, Stefan is a professor and director of biotechnology at the University of Braunschweig in Germany. At the German Cancer Research Center, he co-pioneered in vitro antibody selection technologies, and he initiated the antibody factory of the German National Genome Research Network. He's the editor of the Handbook of Therapeutic Antibodies and other antibody engineering books. He's also the co-founder of several biotech companies including the animal-free antibody company Abcalis and the human therapeutic antibody discovery and antibody engineering company UMAM. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Stefan. Hello, everybody out there. My name is Stefan Dübel. I'm professor at the University of Braunschweig in Germany, and um, I welcome you to my presentation about the animal-free generation of antibodies. So, what's all about the new methods to generate antibodies, which not only are claiming to be completely animal-free, but also better in quality? Why should we consider these antibodies? Because they offer much more than just a replacement. They offer better quality, they offer a better versatility, and they could be made much more quickly. And I will show you examples for all of that. Let's start with quality. Many papers are um, complaining about the quality of research reagents, in particular research antibodies, when they are made from animals because they are not a replenishable resource. All the polyclonal antibodies um, allow to make a couple of experiments, but they cannot be repeated in, in 20 years or so because the reagent is just gone. And also the polyclonal nature as a blood product may cause false reactivities, and we will see examples for that. So um, it's called antibody anarchy, like you see in this paper, uh, they are calls to standardize the antibodies and to improve reproducibility. And one author even titled the antibody horror show. And this is not um, something which is not known. And we can test it. Um, and publications like this are now more and more appearing with the advent of larger protein arrays. And here you see a, an epitope array um, published in the last PEX meeting. And all the blue spikes here are fails positive reactivities. The antigen here, this is a polyclonal serum from, from Atlas antibodies, um, as an example, with many other others looking like that. Um, and the red one here is the correct one. And uh, the two spikes in red 
are the spikes by a monoclonal antibody. So um, this is a typical profile of a research reagent. We trust to get good results in our experiments because that's what we buy in the catalogs. Here is a more dramatic example and also a way how we can avoid that by animal-free antibodies. And um, what you see is a whole mount from zebrafish. Here is a cerebellum, spinal cord, so the neuronal tissue. Um, and the uh, blue fluorescent here is a GFP labeling. So that's, that's really the antigen present. It's not an antibody staining, it's the antigen itself lighting up in the fluorescent um, illumination. And here is a the gold standard um, antibody which has been used for most of the papers. And um, if you use a fish mutant which does not have the antigen, you still get a lot of react reactivity. So clearly there are many false positive results out there. And here is the same experiment done with a recombinant antibody. Um, and you see everything is black where it should be black. No fails reactivity. It can be done. Okay, you say, let's take monoclonal antibodies. They solve the problem. True for many cases, wrong for a significant number of cases. Here are the results of a multicentric study. And what we did, we sequenced hybridoma clones. 185 different clones from seven different labs in five countries. So it's really a mixture of everything which is out there. Most of them are commercial viable products from catalogs, actually. Maybe you have bought one or, or the other of these and used in experiments. And then we produced them recombinantly. Uh, first we looked on the sequences, but then we produced them and compared the specificity with the direct purification on the same purification method, which is a protein A column. And so it's IgG of the same purity compared directly uh, between the recombinant and the hybridoma su uh, supernatant. And we found dramatic results and we found a lot of problems. Despite two thirds of these hybridomas produce just what we expect them to produce, one antibody, one third had additional at least one light chain, sometimes more. So in all this uh, hybridoma um, cells, one cell, it's not a contamination with um, two cells. So it's not the clonality, it's still monoclonal. It's, it's one cell produces three different antibodies, which are shown here. And the correct one is always, in these cases, produced in a lower amount. And we directly see that when we put it on tests, and we did a lot of tests in that paper here. And here you see, for example, false positive reactivities. And um, you don't see that in every assay, in every um, antigen uh, antibody combination, of course, because your wrong reactivity has to be matched by an antigen, which reacts with that uh, in the particular assay. So it can behave very different between different assays. But what you see is always that you have this dilution factor. So the same amount of purified, highly purified IgG from a hybridoma always reacts um, much lower um, compared to the recombinant form if you have an additional chain present. So hybridomas are also not the final solution to everything. How can we do it differently? How can we produce animal-free derived antibodies, which are um, not having these problems. And the method, of course, uh, of choice for most of the applications and the most widely used method is uh, phage display. What are we doing here? We use the world's antibody gene repertoire. Actually, we have it in the fridge. We have 10 billion human antibody genes in the fridge already. And these were already cloned into a system called phage display particle. And this is a phage particle in the um, phage itself. You have the gene and the gene encodes for an antibody which is linked to the surface of the phage. So you have not only one of these phage, but you have the entire human antibody repertoire in form of phage particles, which are very small particles, nanoparticles with one antibody and um, 
the gene in the backpack. What you do in a process called panning, you incubate these huge diversity of structural solutions for binders with an antigen of your choice, the green one here. And only the ones which bind by the surface expressed antibodies are enriched in that process. The other ones are washed away, so you get one human antibody binding here. It's really a one molecule interaction, which you see. And because that's a phage, it can infect bacteria and grow back to a clone. So you can identify the individual antibody gene encoding this functional antibody here. Once you get the gene, you can clone it in all other formats you like. And typically today we, we do uh, complete IgGs for all kinds of applications. And um, so you can get antibodies without any immunization, just from taking out the world's repertoire out of the fridge, make a display, panning and subcloning, and then you get antibodies to any target. It's really that simple. One advantage that you don't have in animals is already coming out here on that method. The entire process of the selection, in the very moment the antibody binds to the antigen, can be completely biochemically controlled. So you can look for cross-reactivities, you can compete, you can add cofactors for um, particular conformations you want to induce, uh, change pH, salt, whatever you like in that uh, vial where you do this, uh, this panning reaction, which is uh, less than a milliliter. And by controlling that reactivity, you can pre-design the properties of your reagent and can change it to what you need in your particular assay. One example is shown here. The idea here is to substitute secondary antibodies, which make up a large fraction of antiserum products, so of animal-derived antibodies in the markets, and you can substitute them and you can gain from that. So what we do, we take the advantages of the monoclonal antibodies and of the polyclonal antibodies and combine them. The monoclones have some disadvantages. They are, of course, animal-derived. They recognize just one epitope, whereas the polyclonals can have uh, binders, as they are a mixture, recognizing different epitopes, so they can have a stronger activity and better work in different um, conformations of the antigen. And also we saw already that one third of the hypodomas contain additional specificities, so we, we have to get rid of them. Also we have to get rid of the unwanted specificities in the blood of animals, because the blood of animals contains lots of antibodies which are not reacting to our target of um, uh, uh, we want to, to stain with this antibody. So what we do, we make recombinant antibodies by phage display, um, so no animal use in that. The composition is completely known. The defined epitopes allow us to make combinations which suit every possible assay we can test before. We eliminate all unknown reactivities, and also it's an unlimited reagent. So in 20 years, if you want to make the same experiment, you can still do it because you have the entire composition as a file on the USB stick. You always know the sequence. We can even add some additional functions. Uh, so we have a free choice of FC. We can make it every species we like by adding a C part of a horse or a mouse or a rat and make it compatible. And we see in a, in a minute that this is an advantage. And the mixture can be adapted to an assay. So here's the way we do it. We just make phage display antibodies. Then we mix them. We determine the mix by the features we want to have in the mix. And then you can label it like a typical um, animal serum and can use it as a secondary antibody. And it has advantages. Here you see our first product, which is an um, anti-human IgG secondary antibody, reacts with all the different subtypes, but it does not re react whatever, whatsoever with uh, the ones you want to exclude, bovine, rabbit, goat, horse, mouse, and so on. 
It's very stable, so we can select the individual clones for stability, and here you see a dramatical, uh, dramatic experiment. It's freeze-thaw 25 times and looking on a size exclusion, and you see the mixture here is completely stable. There are almost a very, very small bump here coming up at after 25 cycles of freezing and thawing, something you anyway don't do with your antibody from animals. So we can select to make it much more stable reagents. And the most important thing is that we can lower the background and eliminate the specificities coming from the undefined nature of the mixture of the immunoglobulins in the animals. And here you see an example. This is a, the, a green one, is a typical um, a multiclonal. And here we have a typical catalog product, which is made from animals. And before you reach the maximum, the background comes up, and in our product we can just eliminate that. And this is an antibody um, um, from a very large company. Many of you, I'm sure, have already used it. So here we have an undefined mixture. That's the reason for that. And here we have the known sequence, and we can eliminate everything which is not um, wanted in that reactivity. Completely different example for um, non-animal derived antibodies that they can replace polyclonal sera is a project we did uh, financed by the PETA International Science Corporation um, together with the NIBSC in, in, in London. And you know that diphtheria toxin is not anymore a product much needed because we can vac vaccine our, vaccinate our children and um, but in some uh, situations, some countries, uh, there are still outbreaks of diphtheria due to um, limited access to the vaccination. So we need some antiserum, and it's still made in horses under very cruel conditions. Here is a, um, a video you can watch, and it's really cruel. So we try to do that animal-free from phage display, and we were able to show that we make better antibodies than the polyclonal horse sera, which are in the clinic. Here is some data. Um, so these are all neutralizing antibodies. And the black one here is the polyclonal clinical standard. And um, the green one is uh, one of ours, which is the world's best um, diphtheria toxin neutralizing antibody certified by the NIBC in London, which standardizes all these products. So we can really show that we can go beyond what can be done from, from animal sera um, here as well. Let's quickly look on the versatility of animal-free antibodies. Um, it's really easy to make them if you have the technology running up and running. It's not easy to set it up, but once you have it up and running, you can make literally thousands of antibodies. We made here in uh, only in academic consortia, we made more than 3,000 to more than 500 different antigens from our universal libraries. And after that, you can change the FC part. You can exchange that part just by cloning to cho choose what you want to have. This can be an advantage. And here's a, a data set um, made by Frank Perez and his co-workers. So the same antibody was made with three different species, FC, human, mouse, rabbit. Another antibody also done the same, a third and a fourth. And then you can make the staining and show that they are all the same, not um, completely independent from the FC part. But because you have different FC parts, you can now make combination stainings, which you can never do with a um, respective animal antibodies. You are limited to to um, to, to uh, the animal you made the antibodies in. So that that's one example of added versatility just by having the recombinant reagents, which are always have if you do it animal free. You can also improve the antibodies. Here's an example for mama carcinoma antibody. Um, a 500 fold affinity maturation could be achieved with a few mutations, in vitro evolution mutations. Also, the stability of the original, which was not existing, more or less, could be changed to one month at 37 degrees in serum, so completely stable. And even the aggregation propensity was much reduced in that example. 
So you can, after getting the antibody, you can improve it further and change a lot of different properties, um, which you cannot do, of course, with any animal serum derived product. Next, speed. Speed is, in these days of the pandemics, very, very much and um, very prominently exemplified by the examples presented by many companies using phage display to generate anti-SARS-CoV-2 um, antibodies within less than four weeks. And this is just not possible in animal-derived systems and shows you that we have a potential to improve our research by just getting results quicker when we use non-animal-derived antibodies. So here is an example from, from our own work. Um, it's it's a, a collaboration with, with UMAP and CORAT. Uh, we used healthy donor libraries as well as uh, convalescent patient libraries later on. So these represent Im immunized libraries, but also with the universal libraries. We got a lot of clones, and these clones are already now in preclinical development to serve as a, a drug to cure uh, COVID-19. It was very, very rapid. Here you see some typical results, uh, neutralizing curves. Um, these are curves of neutralization of virus attachment protein binding, and um, the lower um, graph here are all the individual clones uh, we tested, and you see many of them, the colored ones, are nice, nicely neutralizing. So even from a universal non-immunized library, you get a nice um, a result in respect of functional neutralization of SARS-CoV-2 binding. And it also works with the live virus. So here you see neutralizing um, antibodies here, the healthy cells, infected cells, they round themselves up and die. Here is a control antibody, and here is our antibody, which completely protects against the virus infection over um, four to five days here. And this is uh, the model we, uh, at the moment, look at. Um, these are the models based on two epitope mappings. So we know that the antibodies bind in that region and got them modeled uh, in the binding region, and they are just blocking this spike protein which has to contact the cell. Um, and when you block the surface with the antibody, it cannot bind anymore. But we can also use the um, antibodies for diagnostics. And here is uh, antibodies which discriminate very nicely between the COF2 and the SARS-CoV-1 virus, as well as all the other ones, the MERS and all the other um, uh, coronaviruses, and also you can get these antibodies very quickly out of a universal library without any immunization. That's the potential of the technology. Summarizing that, I think if we don't look into non-animal derived antibodies in the next uh, uh, years, we miss a lot of opportunities. because quality, versatility, and speed are aspects which come together with the non-animal derived generation of the antibodies. And we could benefit in our experiments a lot from these. And most of these um, advantages cannot be achieved by just taking animal derived antibodies. And we should learn more about these new applications, the new properties we can gain from um, the non-animal derived format and from the way we make it by phage display. So in the future, I hope that uh, this knowledge about the additional features, the better quality, the higher speed and so on, will spread um, more quickly among everybody and these antibodies gain much more than a little piece of the market, which they at the moment already have in the catalogs, but the people are just not aware of the vast opportunities um, which are uh, still under the water for, for, for um, um, a lot of different scientific community using antibodies every day. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And in particular, I have to thank all the people who did the work 
I'm only the guy to show the slides. Here are the people who did the work and the partners who fund that and work together with us. And with that, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact uh, me or any of these um, uh, addresses shown here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing this information. As a reminder, we're going to hold all questions to the end, but please send them in at any time using the GoToWebinar questions panel, and we will ask them after our next presentation. Speaking next will be Dr. Sachdev Sidhu. Sachdev was a principal investigator in the Department of Protein Engineering at Genentech for 10 years, where he led the development on its phage display technology. As a professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and the Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research at the University of Toronto, he now focuses on protein engineering and technologies with the aim of crafting better therapies for cancer and other diseases. Sachdev is also the founder of the Toronto Recombinant Antibody Center and the Center for Commercialization of Antibodies and Biologics. Hey, uh, thank you. Um... I'm going to continue the theme from Stefan. Um, he did a great job of introducing uh, phage display, so I won't um, dwell on that. And also the idea of in vitro selections as a means for getting more versatile antibodies. Um, as you'll see, my group does a lot of work in this area, but I thought just out of interest, and as one example, I'd focus on how we use uh, synthetic antibody libraries. And I'll explain what I mean by that uh, to look at. Uh, COVID-19 and see how rapidly we could uh, develop very good neutralizing agents. Um, <clears throat> so a little, I'm going to start with uh, COVID itself. Um, it's, uh, it's coronavirus and in a way it has a fairly simple life cycle unlike uh, HIV and retroviruses in that it doesn't incorporate into the genome and we and others believe that as a result uh, it's a good candidate for antibody-based therapies because keeping it very simple the virus interacts with ACE2 uh, the host receptor and this is absolutely necessary for the virus to enter the cell so very simple point then is uh, if antibodies can block this interaction uh, it can and does and should inhibit the virus getting into the cell and if you inhibit that step obviously uh, there's no further replication or amplification of the virus. Um, and we know from a lot of lines of evidence, including uh, some clinical trials that have already started with um, therapeutic antibodies, also from convalescent plasma, and from the simple fact that there is a strong correlation between uh, recovery in patients and a strong uh, neutralizing antibody response that this should work at least in um, some settings. So it's a uh, promising means because as you know the virus currently has uh, virtually no targeted therapies therapies that very precisely target the virus itself um, and target key steps such as infection that are required uh, for COVID-19 disease um, so a little about the virus it's to me it's been a very good time to be in science because uh, it's a major challenge to the world but we can't underestimate how rapidly things have moved. Um, we already have cryo-EM structures of the spike protein, uh, reconstructions of the whole virus. And this actually is very useful because it tells us that not only does the virus require interaction with the host, we already have the precise epitope at the tips of these spikes, uh, the receptor binding domains that interact with ACE2. Um, and again, if we can develop antibodies or other agents that bind here. Uh, it's a simple but effective means for blocking viral entry. So these would be prime candidates for biologic therapeutics uh, for COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> again, I won't belabor the point as uh, Stefan went through this, uh, except to say our system is in a way even uh, more extreme than his system in that uh, we use what are synthetic antibodies. So we don't use any source of natural diversity because um, you can immunize animals to get antibodies. We all know that. Or in the case of COVID-19, there's been very effective means of harvesting B cells from humans 
uh, building either immune libraries or naive libraries. Um, so that's not what we do. Uh, what we do is phage display, uh, already described. But I'll describe our differences and kind of the further unique aspects of our strategy. Uh, so unlike natural repertoires, we've taken a very extreme approach. Uh, we start from the very beginning with a single human framework and we thought if we're going to make antibodies we want to be stable, versatile <clears throat> and ultimately drugs in some cases. Why not start with one of the most validated antibody drugs, Herceptin, and that same framework has been used with a few modifications for many other antibody drugs. And the big advantage here is if we start with a fixed framework, uh, we have to get versatility, which I will show you we've proven we can hit any epitope of interest, uh, but nothing changes except function. Uh, it's fixed biophysics and it's modular design. Um, in other words, the purification, the storage, the stability, all the properties that define the protein except its binding are virtually identical to that of Herceptin and are very identical to each other. So it's a very scalable system. And, you know, this is a highly validated technology of not just phage display, but the idea of um, limited frameworks and, you know, it's fully human, stable, long half lives, potent, etc. cetera. Um, and antibodies drugs now are highly prevalent and more and more of these are becoming derived from phage methods or other methods. Um, and what we do then is only randomize those residues that from a lot of studies, this is decades of work, uh, we and others have defined as the most crucial for antigen recognition. Uh, so minimum but significant changes in the binding site. Uh, but the question is, can systems like this work? You can make very large libraries, but obviously these are from design. So there's a real question whether the designs are good enough to get binders and how versatile are they? Um, <clears throat> so in about a decade in Toronto alone, my, this is from my lab alone, uh, we've done greater than 1,300 antigens, uh, fully characterized over 14,000 antibodies. And as Stefan showed, there can be all levels of characterization. But in our case, these are sequence defined. All have been made as fabs. Most have been made as IgGs in milligram quantities. I won't get into the details. Not only do we have binding to the antigen of interest, we have binding data for close homologs for families, uh, species cross-reactivity, affinity. In many cases, they're epitope bind. So this is a very validated set, and it's completely, of course, uh, DNA-defined. And most of our work so far has been done on cancer and other diseases and most of these are human targets. Uh, but of course the great, uh, and I should say we've been using them as a bridge between functional uh, genomics and models of disease. But because it's a platform, we've also done work with viral disease. And this goes back a few years, but it, with Ebola, it proved some important points. Um, if you can make antibodies recombinantly that are very high affinity for Ebola, we showed that not only could you protect um, mice from infection with the virus, uh, but afterwards uh, they became completely immune. Uh, so this is a reason why these should be effective drugs because a single treatment or maybe a couple of treatments, um, we believe uh, SARS is similar to Ebola and that has a cute life cycle. Uh, and we'll see how the clinical trials that are ongoing prove, but it should also be that the natural immune system then kicks in. That's a big bonus of antibodies as drugs. They do work with the natural immune system, whether it's virus or cancer or other diseases. <clears throat> and the good news for, uh, I think, potential application of therapeutic antibodies is uh, convalescent plasma therapy is also showing uh, some efficacy. So this is the idea of transferring antibodies from recovered patients into um, symptomatic patients. And given that this is a very undefined mixture of antibodies, some neutralizing, some not, as Stefan explained, uh, it's good to see that there is some efficacy. Then the simple uh, theory is why not make absolutely defined high affinity neutralizing antibodies and, and further improve on this. Um, so we applied this to COVID-19 very rapidly, 
give some timelines. And for us, the good thing is we didn't start working on the virus until March 24th when we got some antigen from a collaborator. But again, key point, it is a platform. The antigen really doesn't matter. The same methods can be applied uh, to any antigen of interest. Um, so the methods we have always work. Uh, this We got 380, 300 something antibodies that bound to the receptor binding domain and were specific. A subset of about 66 not only bound but competed with the host receptor. Um, so we're, for now we focused on those. And those 66, because we have the genes, could be very rapidly converted into IgGs, pick the best neutralizers. Um, and crucially, because we designed these antibodies with a fixed framework, uh, we designed all the properties, not just the binding. So binding was very tight, but yields of the proteins were very high in the level of Herceptin, which was one of the best yield. SEC profiles, which are a measure of hydrophobicity and developability, indistinguishable from Herceptin. Uh, melting temperatures were over 80 degrees Celsius in the same at the same level of Herceptin. So instantly everything was the same as Herceptin, except the activity was completely changed, obviously, and that's what we want. Uh, so these already had all the characteristics of a developable drug, and that's what we're looking at now. Um, and they do neutralize virus. These are the four best. We took the best of these, did a light chain shuffle, and you can see how rapidly we went from a very respectable, naive affinity especially for a drug-like molecule of 300 picomolar, uh, down to various light chain variants. Um, and our best one looks like it's uh, very low or even sub picomolar by BLI. Um, and we have the data on this that confirms enhanced antiviral activity. I'm not showing it here for interest of time. But the point is not only do you get antibodies, you get uh, drug-like fully human antibodies. And the versatility comes from within a few weeks uh, you can further improve them as needed. Um, and of course, we're going beyond the RBD. That's a nice thing with recombinant methods. In vitro methods are tailor-made for more advanced selections. Once we have antibodies, uh, we can look at different epitopes with epitope blocking methods. We can exhaustively screen. And already we have a, a large number. This number's already changed. This is a couple months old, but a large set against RBD binders. We're looking and do have multiple epitopes even on the RBD. But we also did selections against um, pseudotype VLPs, which are more difficult to do with other methods. Uh, you can do it on whole virus mimics. We get very interesting antibodies. Only one of these uh, binds to the RBD. So now we have a whole other set, and this has gone up to a few hundred that bind other epitopes on the spike. And we've done um, spike selections as well. And we're looking at very using these in combination or as um, multi-specific antibodies. Um, so this is kind of a timeline to see how rapidly these naive approaches can move. Um, and these are literal dates, started on March 24th, had binders by the 29th, uh, screened them by the end of March. And in parallel, we'd already made IgG expression we would made 66 IgGs at milligram scale uh, about five weeks into the project. Uh, so similar to Stefan's timeline, uh, by mid-April, actually four weeks, um, we had 66 IgGs. Um, and then the limiting factor was actually getting these into antiviral testing. Uh, we've done all of this, but we have a collaborator in St. Louis. So between March 24th and April 27th, um, 33 or whatever days, we'd gone from nothing uh, to fully human IgGs at large milligram scale. Um, and we're now moving these forwards and hope to have a clinical trial data soon as a kind of a new means of making antibody drugs uh, for coronavirus. Because uh, the other drugs out there will be very interesting uh, and they're B cell derived by and large. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it at that, as you can tell, we do a lot of stuff. Uh, we have the Donnelly Center, which is developing new technology. We have the Toronto Recombinant Antibody Center that applies it. Uh, there's literally any time close to 100 projects going on. 
Um, but this one was led by Shane Mirsch together with Mark Ustoff, but with a lot of help from other people. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. And, you know, there's questions. Hopefully we can uh, have some answers. Thanks. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Sajdev. Uh, two very interesting presentations for sure, and certainly exciting to see the, the pace at which uh, these, these types of reagents are being developed. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come in. The first one is for Sajdev. It's a, a regulatory question, so I'm not sure if you'll, you'll be able to answer it directly, but we'll give it a shot. Um, the, the, the question is, uh, since you have such good comparative data with Perceptin, the anti-COVID antibody, can you reduce or bypass some or even all of the preclinical animal-dependent safety and toxicity testing and move uh, more quickly or perhaps directly into clinical patients? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the good thing is we're already doing, uh, you need PK and tox, but you're right. Because the original antibody, we have such good biophysical data. We can definitely limit that. You don't have to play around with a lot of variants. Um, so we're going straight to an antibody that, for us then, that data becomes confirmatory in that we don't have to screen tons of clones. Um, and we're seeing that, we're getting the PK data right now. And in a very limited study, it looks again, identical to Herceptin. So there's very good evidence that if these things are well designed from the beginning, because it stands to reason. These are large molecules. And if you're only changing 20 residues in the CDRs, a lot of the other traits are clearly defined by the other 150 kilodaltons of protein mass. So yeah, it does expedite um, virtually all the steps of the process. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank you. If I may add a European perspective to that, uh, Stefan here. Um, we also uh, talk to the respective authorities about the properties and in our case it helped in a very similar way as presented by, by DEF. Um, uh, since the, every sequence which is in our library has been in a healthy person before and didn't kill him and this really helped to convince the, the authorities that this in principle is um, something which can be uh, developed more rapidly with less uh, tox testing uh, for example uh, compared to uh, uh, any kind of uh, chemical drug against COVID-19. So also uh, the, the uh, European um, projects will benefit from that uh, uh, nature of the molecule. Excellent, thank you Stefan. Um, okay, uh, another I guess a two-part question um, that I suppose you, I'll leave our speakers to choose who wants to tackle these. Um, how do these technologies work against a rapidly mutating virus? And second part of that question is, is it known yet if COVID-19 is a rapidly mutating virus? Mr. Fun, you want to go first and then I can comment? Yes. Or... Yeah. Um, it's very simple. Since the method is the fastest, fastest, I mean our method, uh, phage display, non-animal derived, um, most rob robust um, method um, used at the moment is also the quickest, uh, most rapid way to generate antibodies. So when you want to have a chance against rapidly mutating viruses, you can go for that. But what we have seen, for example, with our antibodies, uh, just because we have such such a high number and because we used a, a very huge library, not just an IDG repertoire from one patient who had one uh, particular mu mutant, but we used uh, our universal libraries. And I think that's the reason why we already have antibodies in our hands, which do not um, uh, loose binding when uh, when we uh, test them on uh, on the uh, major mutations of the COVID-19 virus and the uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is not quickly mutating it's very different from HIV for example so it's a slow mutating virus and even then we can be we can find um, epitopes um, 
um, because with the method of phage, uh, we can find antibodies which recognize different mutants, because with the method of phage display, we can, for example, do a panning sequentially on different variants of the virus. And we have shown that for, for other uh, viruses, for uh, um, influenza viruses before, that by that, you can functionally identify the most conservative epitopes of the viruses, probably the ones the virus cannot mutate because it will lose its infectivity. So just by using the method of phage display instead of immunization, you can identify functional epitopes which are conserved between different viruses and uh, so that would also be very helpful if you have a virus which mutates very quickly. Dev? Yeah, that's kind of great points. So I'll add a little bit in that the fundamental thing here is, especially with naive libraries, uh, these are proactive methods, whereas even the most powerful B cell cloning, et cetera, is reactive. What I mean by that is you have to wait for the next virus outbreak to happen. In a few months, you can get antibodies from patients and then develop it. But what's interesting here is um, we're looking now at a, at a project we want to do within the next few months. Um, we have full genomics on thousands of coronaviruses, very closely related to SARS or very different like MERS, et cetera. And it's a large set. And Tavon's right, a saving grace is you don't mutate rapidly. So you can clearly see clusters of SARS-1-like, SARS-2-like, MERS-like. And we're working with informaticians to define all the clusters that are existing in nature. Um, and as Stefan's shown and we've shown, not a hard thing for us to do 100 antigens in a month. Uh, so we're going to make RBDs for maybe as many representatives we need to say 90% similar or more, where antibodies become highly cross-reactive. So why not have antibodies on hand for every virus that may cross over? Uh, which, as I said, is a manageable number. Uh, thousands of viruses clustering in maybe a few hundred at most related groups based on, and we can define this, it's science, greater than 95% identity. And I'm very confident that before there's a COVID-25, if we have a stockpile of 50 different therapeutic antibodies, each one validated against, say, 500 RBDs of real viruses, Chances are one of those will neutralize any emerging virus. So we can build up in a scientific manner um, proactive antibody drugs. And this will be a great test case for that, I believe. Great. Thanks both for that uh, comprehensive answer. There's one last thing, because I, oh, what sure. I, that can be done very rapidly. The expense later is in scale up and stuff, but you'd only need to apply that on the antibody of interest, right? So. You can have this done very cost effectively and be ready to scale up whichever of that large set of antibodies that's needed. Great, thank you. Um, next question, have you seen secondary inflammatory response in your animal model of the virus antibody complex? It's an easy question for me. We haven't done animal studies yet. Um, and we may not, in fact, in this case, we'll probably go straight to human for treatment. Um, maybe Stefan knows, or if he doesn't, I can give a general answer. After. Yeah, no, we have the same. Um, we even did not uh, get the uh, duty to make these animal models because the existing models are not considered to be really conclusive. And the um, structure, the very structure of our molecules is considered um, to be compatible with the direct move to um, humans, as, as same as in your case. Yeah, that's I agree with that. Um, we've looked at models, and they're not good models. Or weirdly, maybe they are good models in that most of the mice or hamsters, some of them don't get infected. They have variable response because this is a highly variable response virus. It's not Ebola, right? Um, and right. so you're planning to then. And we do have approval of this from various regulatory agencies. Um, go straight into humans and do a quick phase one and follow on. And the good news from convalescent plasma trials, which is a similar approach, is 
uh, at least there are virtually no adverse reactions. So I do believe, and I think we'll see that from Lilly and Regeneron have trials, that it will be well tolerated and safe, and then we'll need to look at efficacy. But in this case, efficacy clearly should be done in humans. Great, thanks both. And I, I was hoping that was gonna be your answer. That, that's outstanding. Um, next question, could the universal antibody you mentioned be used against the current virus and confer immunity even in the event of a possible mutation? Of what, what kind of mutation? Uh, in the event of a possible mutation, presumably re relating back to the discussion of COVID-19, possibly mutating? Yeah, if this is very simple because the, the mutations are known and we can test, uh, test on mutants, which, which we do, and exclude these antibodies which only bind to a couple of uh, mutants like the Lilly antibody. It does not bind to all the different described uh, mutants. Um, and we can select now these antibodies which bind to every possible described um, a mutant. Yeah, because they yeah, are. I think. It's, not, it's not that they are all over the molecule. They are typically clustered in a, in a, in a number of spots. So you, you have highly conserved um, parts in the spike protein which still allow neutralization. And so in that way, we, we hope to be very broadly reactive against even maybe uh, other upcoming mutations. Yeah, and my hope is here the more the merrier. Maybe this time next year we have 10 safe, effective antibody drugs. Each of them will neutralize the original virus. But the good thing is different ones will be affected different by any emerging mutations. So I think this is a good case where we need multiple different antibodies out there. Um, the virus, I severely doubt, would mutate to out of all of all of them. So it's a good test case for kind of a community-based approach. I'd be happy if the Regeneron drug works. We all need it. But yeah, other ones are better for different strains. Why not have a large set of antibody alternatives as therapies? Because some of them will definitely not be affected by a given mutation. Others may. I agree. Okay, so the, the question that I suppose everybody wants <laughs> answered uh, is, I guess we'll use our last question. The question says, if you have a magic globe, when uh, do you think that you will be able to implement your efforts to the human population and fight COVID-19 and all the upcoming virus challenges and related epidemics? <laughs> Next year. <laughs> no. I mean, well, the, the first clinical studies have started from from Regeneron and so on. And uh, so we will have a, the first generation antibodies quickly. And as as Def just mentioned, we will have secondary uh, products, second line products, uh, which may be more, um, more, more efficient, which may be cheaper, which may um, also protect against mutations. And this will go within, uh, within the next couple of six to, to nine months in, um, in larger scale production for clinical studies, and it will be tested after that. So I think we will see uh, a lot of opportunities. And and the second part of the questions, when we will have antibodies to all viruses, um, I think <clears throat> I, I'm absolutely with uh, the same opinion with Def that it's not a scientific problem which has to be cracked. Um, it's just a money problem. So if we if we finance these sequencings of uh, of uh, um, zoonotic viruses of the future, not only coronaviruses, we can we can uh, sequence all the Ebola viruses and all the other nasty uh, viruses which wait out there in the, in the animals. And um, we know these uh, animal sources. We can go there. We can collect samples. So it's a it's uh, it's a question of money and and will but not anymore a question of science. Yeah, I fully agree and I'll philosophize even a bit further. I think I'm hoping COVID-19 is a turning point where people realize how much human health is connected to world economy, which is important. You have to be able to feed people. You can't feed people if they can't work. So unlike cancer and other diseases, which 
are manageable. They're not infectious. I think there should be a wake up call that you need to be proactive and everybody's health is linked to everybody's health. And the good news here is um, the methods we're describing are precisely, I'll say it again, proactive, scalable, systematic. Uh, at this point, it's just a matter of will. In other words, there's no methodological limitations. In a way, viruses are much easier for antibody development. That's what the immune system evolved to than the more difficult things we've been doing, which is cancer, et cetera. There's no tox because it's not a host protein. Many of these are acute. You need one or two injections. You know exactly which epitopes to hit. Um, so it's, and that's the good news. I think the science here, much more so than in cancer and other diseases, which are more uh, complex, it's very clear cut what we need to do. And uh, I think these examples alone are proving it's doable on the scale of months and it's scalable. One to 10 to 100, uh, it's, it's very doable. Great, so we have just a, a couple minutes left. Um, we have one last minute question for Stefan. I'll ask for a, a quick answer to this one. Does antibody injection produce lasting immunity as does vaccination? No, it does not. But typically in a virus infection, um, um, if somebody is protected for some time, um, he has time to develop his own um, immune uh, defense against uh, the virus and so uh, the passive vaccination as it is called with antibodies does not generate long-term immunity but it is on the other hand much more quickly than a classical vaccination and I would like to shed um, my opinion on the fact that if we have good antibodies at the end of this year we don't even need a vaccine because if somebody comes to the clinic and we can treat him just by one shot to protect him from that infection, um, to get severe cases and to be in intensive care, we don't need to vaccinate all the people because then we can heal the disease, we can cure the disease. Yeah, let me add one minute of that. Um, it does not generate immunity on its own, but when we and others worked on Ebola, the good news was this it works with the immune system. So if you had the, um, a challenge with Ebola, and this was even done in a few humans. If you then added a therapeutic antibody, it allowed the rest of the immune system more time. And then there was lasting immunity. And Stefan's right, with a virus like this, maybe 5% of people are at risk. You test, if you're okay, just isolate for a while, but, if you're at high risk, you could add the antibody. And I don't believe this needs to be proven, but it makes sense. It simply gives your immune system a boost. The only reason you're dying is because your immune system can't develop antibodies rapidly enough. You can and should still have natural antibodies being built up. And those should remain just like after a vaccine. So I think if you use it in this smart way, uh, most people won't need any treatment or minimal treatment. Maybe 5% of the people need an antibody. But if you give it at, say, a point where the virus is starting to replicate, the natural immune system will still take place in the background. <clears throat> okay, great. Thanks both for those encouraging words. That's exciting as well. Um, so with that, I'll thank everyone for joining today's webinar. And, and certainly thanks very much to Stefan and uh, Sachna for some excellent talks today and the first of a series of webinars. Um, you can see on your screen uh, contact information for myself and Catherine. Um, I would encourage folks, if you have additional questions for the speakers, feel free to send those um, and we'll, we'll share those and get you uh, responses to those questions. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the next uh, webinar in this series. Uh, it'll be held on September the 16th at the same time as today's webinar. That's 10 o'clock U.S. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, it'll be on scientific and economic benefits of animal-free antibodies. We're excited to have Dr. Joao Barroso from URL ECBAM to share a summary of a recent uh, report from ECBAM Science Advisory Committee um, that reviewed, reviewed the uh, validity and benefits of using animal-free technology uh, to produce affinity reagents and the subsequent recommendations that came from ECBAM.
Um, so look for uh, registration information for that webinar and thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.